We at Church of the Lakes believe we are a church on the move as we work toward connecting all to Christ to become healthy in God and courageous in love. For that is our mission. We are connecting all to Christ to become healthy in God and courageous in love. Now, knowing that this doesn't happen without intentionality, we have put an exciting process in place to make this become yours and our reality. How do you become all that God desires you to be? Well, you connect, explore, and serve. First, you connect. We encourage you to connect to Christ through worship and prayer. As a congregation, this primarily happens for us on Sunday morning during one of our four worship services and at our Wednesday evening worship service. Everything we do and everything we are is rooted in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this begins with spending time with him through both worship and prayer. Second, after we connect with Christ, we want to explore God's story unfolded in the Bible. This primarily takes place in small groups where we grow healthy in God. We see ourselves not as a church with small groups, but a church of small groups. We explore God's story to know more about God and also to help discover our purpose. Once you have connected to Christ, and explored God's story, you become equipped to engage the world in service locally, regionally, and globally. The church is called by Jesus to shine his light, to share his love with the goal of making God's kingdom in heaven more of a reality here on earth, connecting all to Christ to become healthy in God and courageous in love. We do this again by connecting, exploring, and serving. Now, as you look at this strategy, the inroad to Church of the Lakes may be any one of these three areas. The front door for some people may not be a worship service. Instead, it may be a small group or even an outreach or missional effort. That's okay. The goal is to connect people to Christ and to get them on the pathway of continually connecting to Christ, exploring God's story, and serving our neighbors locally, regionally, and globally. Uh, we are in the midst of a series of messages on Jonah, the runaway prophet, as children, we learn the story of Jonah, who hears the voice of the Lord to go out to Nineveh. And instead of obeying the command, Jonah runs in the complete opposite direction. Now, po most people only remember that Jonah is, was swallowed by a big fish and spit out just to resume on his mission. And as we grow older, we can often just dismiss this story of Jonah as a fanciful children's story. I believe the Jonah story has much to say to us today as we place our loyalty uh, to our nation before our obedience to God. Or what would happen when we're so self-absorbed in our own lives that we forget about others who are in the exact same boat. The story of Jonah, it depicts a staunch religious believer whose prejudice, whose racism gets in the way of following the will of God. His encounter with the Lord is intended to help all believers to repent of running from God and instead accept the grace that saves us from destruction. So friends, up to this point in our series, we have discovered that Jonah is an important part of the government of King Jeroboam II of Israel around 750 B.C. And as a prophet, his job is to listen for the voice of Yahweh and then speak to the people. One day, he hears the message to preach a message of repentance to his dreaded enemies, the people of Nineveh. And Jonah doesn't want the people of Nineveh to repent. Instead, he wants them to die. <laughs> so Jonah tries to flee from the presence of the Lord. 
by getting on a boat filled with foreign sailors who are heading as far west as Jonah could book passage. And so last week, we saw how the Lord hurled a great storm which threatened everyone on board from going under. And while all these foreign sailors were praying to their gods and doing all they could to keep the boat from sinking, what was Jonah doing? He was sleeping in the cargo hold. Even when the captain woke him up, he didn't even help the crew. Jonah didn't even pray to the Lord for help. When the sailors then realized that Jonah was the cause of the storm, they still worked hard to bring the ship back to harbor. As I mentioned last week, while observing the sailor's sacrifice on his behalf, our prophet begins to take uh, responsibility for his disobedience, and he then prevails upon the crew to throw him into the water. No sooner is Jonah in the water when the wind and the waves subside, and these foreign sailors call out to the God of Israel. They make sacrifice and vows to Yahweh. Of course, the irony is that Jonah, who is trying to avoid preaching to the enemy in Nineveh, he ends up converting a crew of pagan sailors. Uh, this is where today's message picks up. And Katie's going to share with you uh, this passage of Scripture. Good morning. This morning's Scripture lesson comes from our book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17 through the end of chapter 2. Hear now the word of the Lord. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. The word of God for the people of God. Uh, this past week, news emerged from the Australian state of Tasmania that marine biologists were striving to save hundreds of pilot whales after they had inexplicably beached themselves on the shore of that island. Evidently, these whales can really become disoriented and because they travel in close-knit pods, if the leader becomes stuck in the sand, then the rest of the pod of whales will join their leader on the beach. And so, a team of about 60 people, they've used slings and other equipment to help pull some of these whales off the sandbanks uh, so that they can become fully immersed in the water. And once these whales are refloated, they are then guided back to deeper waters by their human guides. And as of this week, about 50 whales made it back into the sea, which by the scientists' efforts was deemed a success. Of course, the reality is that nearly 300 of these whales perished on the shoreline of Tasmania. As one of those rescuers by the name of Ian Burgess told the BBC, quote, there are a couple of live ones and we'll try to get them back into the water, but it's a losing battle. Think of that, friends. Humans rescuing whales. <laughs> but as I read that story this week from Tasmania, 
I was actually transported back to uh, another account where, frankly, the tables were turned uh, to the story of Jonah a lar- and a large fish helped rescue a human. <laughs> As Katie read Jonah 1 verse 17, we learn that being, after being tossed overboard into the raging seas, the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. Now, uh, it is at this point that many people, they just roll their eyes and they conclude that Jonah is just a children's story or some ancient legend. How could a guy survive being swallowed by a big fish? Now, you can read some commentaries and articles of accounts in the history of the whaling industry of people being swallowed by an aggressive whale. Think good old Moby Dick. And then being spit out. Other articles on Jonah, they conclude that this account of Jonah being swallowed by a fish is a poetic description of being rescued from a spiritual storm that Jonah faced when he tried to run away. Other articles, they focus on the observation that the great fish is a symbolic representation of the vast power of evil that stands against God. Now, how you respond to the Bible saying that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish is really related on how you read the rest of the Bible. For if you accept the existence of God, which you cannot prove, or the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which frankly is a far greater miracle than being swallowed by a fish, then it is not difficult to read Jonah literally. If you believe all miracles are impossible, I hope you realize that that skepticism towards the Bible is also a belief that cannot be proven. Wherever you come out on the swallowed by the fish part, my hope is you don't get so distracted that you miss the point of the Jonah account in the Bible, which is when all of your efforts, all of your schemes, all of your resources to save yourself are exhausted. The Lord will rescue us. When we seek the Lord's great mercy. You know, if people ask me, what is the path to experience the salvation that God's grace offers? I think Jonah chapter 2 offers us a great roadmap to the Lord's salvation. As we turn to chapter 2, we see that the first step of being rescued by the Lord from the power of death and of hell is, first of all, recognizing that you are broken and you are in need. For if you have convinced yourself that you don't need to repent of your sin, then you will not experience the salvation that the Lord freely offers. I am reminded of a great quote by C.S. Lewis. When he observed, you know, friends, there are only two kinds of people in the world. There are those who say to God, thy will be done, and those whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, they choose it. Without that self-choice, there would be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy... What will we'll ever miss it? Those who seek will find. Those who will knock, it is open. You know, the process of God's rescue plan, it involves ditching the pretense that you have it all together. I think the genius of the 12-step movement revolves around seeking or making a decision to turn your will and your lives over to the care of God. In the story of Jonah, While he is in the midst of the dark depths of his life, we read in verse 2, quote, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. When that ship was being tossed around, Jonah didn't pray to the Lord. uh, uh, Only in the midst of complete failure in his life would Jonah find the path back to his recovery. You know, in my own life story, of trying to run from God when I was 20 years old. I hit my low point, and then I realized I needed help. And I surrendered to the will of the Lord and called out for help. 
I hear story after story of followers of Jesus who in the midst of their darkest time found healing and hope by letting go of their pretense and letting God take over their lives. Which I think leads us to the next part of God's rescue plan, which is when you realize that you are powerless to rescue yourself. Friends, when it comes to your eternal salvation, you don't have the intelligence, you don't have the experience, you don't have the resources to fix yourself. You need help. The world wants to tell you, well, you know, if you just got more information or you got the right medicine or the right therapy, then you can fix all of your problems. I have both bad news and good news for you. Bad news? You can't fix your brokenness on your own. (laughs) You can receive an Ivy League education. You can develop an impressive stock portfolio. You can even surround yourself with hordes of friend and family, but you can't fix your disobedient and sin-scarred, broken life. The good news is the Lord can save you. (laughs) You know, while Jonah was in the darkest depths of his life at being swallowed by a great fish, he called out in verse 6, Quote, I went down into the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Jonah has come to the realization he can't run from God. He cannot save himself. It's only when Jonah has hit rock bottom and has called out to God for help and realized he was powerless to save himself, that he began to experience the next step on the path of being rescued, which is to appreciate the cost of salvation that God offers. Tim Keller notes that when Jonah was in the darkness of the fish, that he doesn't look merely to heaven for help, but he looks to the temple of Yahweh, For instance, in verse 4, we read, quote, I look upon your holy temple. And then again, in verse 7, Jonah directs his prayer to Yahweh in his holy temple. You know, at first glance, you might think it's a little odd that Jonah is focusing on the temple instead of directing his attention to God. I'm pretty confident that if you were in imminent danger of your own life, I doubt if you're calling out to the church to rescue you. (laughs) No, you're calling out to God to rescue you. Why is Jonah looking to the temple for help at the lowest time in his life? What we have to remember is that in Jonah's day, the temple was the location of the mercy seat of Yahweh. We may recall in the book of Exodus, We learn that when Moses received the law of Yahweh on Mount Sinai, he then placed that in the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, think of good old Indiana Jones and and, uh, the lost uh, Ark. Well, on top of that Ark was a slab of gold with the depictions of two angels. This slab of gold was called the Mercy Seat, and that was the holiest place for the people of Israel. If you remember from the Old Testament, once a year, the high priest of the temple would then sprinkle the blood of an innocent lamb on on this mercy seat. It would act as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people. On this day of atonement, which the people of Israel call Yom Kippur, which is actually today, September 27th. In synagogues all over the world, observant Jews gather today for the purpose to pray to the Lord, read the scripture, and to make sacrificial actions for repentance of one's own sins against God. In this sense, atonement means to repair a broken relationship between sinful humanity and a holy God. For Jonah... The temple was the residence of the holy God who is perfect. This God provides his law to show us how to love the Lord our God and to love one another. This is God's will, to keep his commandments. Yet we humans are incapable of obeying them. 
we miss the mark, which is what we call sin. And since we sin and fall short of God's purpose, how can we be restored and find connection to the Lord who is holy? Doesn't the law of God condemn us? Of course the law condemns us. And it shows us how far we miss the mark. Yet, this holy God gave us a means to his people to be restored in fellowship. In the Old Testament, we read how the blood of an unblemished lamb could be sprinkled by the high priest on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. This blood of the lamb would then shield the people from condemnation. As Tim Keller notes, neither the Jonah nor any person at that time could understand what this meant, that the blood of the lamb could take away the sins of the world. Yet, no better picture of the good news of Jesus could hardly be imagined. Followers of Jesus of Nazareth don't need a yearly blood sacrifice at the temple to make us right with God. Jesus Christ entered this world to save and to seek those who are lost by his innocent blood on that cross that you are saved. You're given the gift of salvation and the ability to connect with the holy God. Only when a person recognizes that you are broken and in need, only when we realize we are powerless to rescue ourselves, only when we appreciate the sacrifice of the cost of salvation that God offers us as a deliverance from sin and death, then I think we experience this grace where we all hunger to have. You know, friends, at the end of Jonah chapter 2, the prophet ends his prayer to the Lord with a shout, quote, deliverance belongs to the Lord. This really is the central message of the good news of Jesus. God is in the business of rescuing and restoring people. We do not, we cannot save ourselves, but even in the deepest depths, the Lord hears our prayers and promises us if we call out for help, he will rescue and provide a path to abundant and everlasting life. You know, throughout Jonah's story, we see the different ways that God provides for us, even when, even when we're not always paying attention, even if we may be trying to run away. For Jonah, God provided unbelieving sailors whose sacrifice on his behalf sparked his turn around to God by his taking responsibility for his disobedience. For Jonah, God then provided a great fish that helped him realize how dark it would be without the Lord in his life. And in the end, it served as a vessel to bring him back on track to his appointed task. And later, we're going to see that God even provides a bean plant to give him shelter from the sun. A theme of Jonah is that Yahweh provides for us again and again and again. And even when we are running away in the opposite direction, the Lord's persistent love crosses our path again and again. So friends, maybe you're feeling distant from the presence of God. Perhaps you're in a dark spot spiritually. I hope we, real, we realize that when all of our efforts, all of our schemes, all of our resources to save ourselves are exhausted, that we will then sense the Lord will rescue us when we seek the Lord's mercy. I hope that with Jonah, we too can shout out deliverance, belongs to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, despite the fact that we try to run, despite the fact that we are broken, sin-scarred creatures, your whole purpose is to bring us the offer of salvation. Help turn our hearts to you. It's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen.